Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast, where it's all about turning your job search into a slam dunk. Your host is Angela Copeland. Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Angela Copeland. Live on the phone with me today, I have Susan Colantuno. Susan is the CEO of Leading Women, a management consulting firm that empowers women. She works to uncover the hidden gender biases and to help managers and executives think more deeply about the role gender plays in the workplace. She's also the author of No Ceiling, No Walls, which takes a close look at the conventional wisdom keeping women from rising from middle management. Susan, thank you for joining me today. No, it's a pleasure, Angela. Thank you for inviting me. I mentioned I'm I'm so excited to have you here and to really get your wisdom. I know you've been studying this topic for a very long time, and um, actually, you founded your organization, Leading Women, 12 years ago um, after spending a number of years as an organizational consultant. Can you talk a little bit about what inspired you to start Leading Women? Well, there's a bit of a long story about that. Uh, In the early 70s, I was one of three women who started a women's initiative at the insurance company that we worked at. And we made tremendous progress in the first three years of that initiative. We doubled the number of women supervisors and doubled the number of women managers at the company. or as a result of the initiative, Mm -hmm. uh, those percentages were doubled. And then I stayed at that company for about uh, four more years, and then I left to do the consulting work that you managed, Mm -hmm. thinking, wow, you know, the progress for women advancing in organizations is really moving quickly, and I'm very excited about that, and now I'll go off and, and do my own thing. So then about 1999, uh, 2000, I I paused at one of those moments that people come to in their careers Mm -hmm. and say, what do I want to (laughs) do with the rest of my life or when I grow up? Mm -hmm. And I looked around and what I observed was that there had been a lot of progress for women getting into middle management but that the progress had pretty much stalled. The percentages of women moving to the top was still very slow and in no way reflected the percentages of women in the middle. Mm-hmm. So I, had, I, you know, I, I made that observation, and about that time I was reading Jim Collins' wonderful book, Good to Great, mm-hmm. where he talked about the hedgehog, uh, which was one of the factors that helped companies move from good performance in the marketplace to great performance in the marketplace. Right. And that, do you know that book? I do. It's been a while since I read it, but I've read it. Mm -hmm. Well, when he talks about the hedgehog, he described it as the place where three circles overlapped, Mm -hmm. uh, what the companies were passionate about, what they could be best in the world at, and what their profit formula was. So I looked at that model, and I said, man, I think that could help me figure out what I want to do with the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, what am I passionate about? Uh, What do I excel at? And and, um, what can I make money doing? And the hedgehog was women's leadership (laughs) development. (laughs) So that gave birth to leading women. uh, It's been through several iterations, but really that was the genesis. Well, that's a great story, and I think it's great for our listeners because many people who listen to this podcast are looking for a job, and many of them are in a major life transition where they're trying to figure out, you know, I'm not happy with what I've been doing, or I want to do something more meaningful. What is it? And the process that you described is perfect. (laughs) Yeah, so I would recommend this is a process for anyone who's listening who may be at that place that you're describing. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what, what am I passionate about? what am I good at and what can I make money doing? (laughs) Because lots of times people get stuck in jobs that they're good at, but Mm -hmm. not necessarily passionate about. And when, when it's possible to find the overlap between those two, all of a sudden work doesn't feel like work. Mm -hmm. Work feels like fun. 
Right. And uh, yeah, I feel that way about what I do every day. Well, that's very exciting. Well, one of the things as part of your work, I mentioned in the introduction, you've written a book, No Ceiling, No Walls, where you talk about leadership. And in particular, you mentioned three elements of leadership. Can you walk us through a little bit about those three elements? Okay. So when I decided that the space I wanted to move into was to create a firm that was going to enable more women to move to the top of organizations and enable companies to close that leadership gender gap, it was patently obvious to me that women would advance only on the basis of their proven and perceived leadership skills, which meant that if I was really going to be a resource, if the company was really going to provide support, that we needed a definition of leadership that was useful and prescriptive and that applied at any level. So I went through a process of looking at many definitions that are out there in the literature, testing them against those three criteria and others, and I couldn't find one that met all my criteria. Some were not useful. Some applied only to people with the titles of executives, Um, And some were, some would apply to Hitler as well as they would apply to Mother Teresa. So, you know, so I discarded lots of uh, definitions. And finally I said, okay, I'm going to have to come up with one. And the definition I came up with is that leadership is using the greatness in you to achieve and sustain extraordinary outcomes by engaging the greatness in others. So those are the three parts that you mentioned. All three parts are important. You cannot be you cannot be seen as a leader unless you use your strengths and attributes and values to contribute to um, the goals of some entity. It could be a corporation. It could be a nonprofit. It could be a social movement. And if you you can't you are only a leader if you achieve those goals by engaging the greatness in other people and that's the prescriptive mm-hmm. part so hitler engaged things less than our greatest selves <laughs> yeah so right. uh, per, yeah personal greatness generally tends to apply to strengths and attributes values our world view our sense of personal purpose mm-hmm. um, achieving and sustaining outcomes generally relates to our business strategic and financial acumen Mm -hmm. and engaging the greatness in others are all the very important interpersonal communication skills, our team um, building and motivation skills, and our strategic networks. Mm. And when you say strategic network, do you mean the folks that we are networking with inside of the workplace or outside? I mean, what do you mean when you say that? Both. When when I talk about strategic networks, I'm talking about about both our internal strategic relationships and also those outside the company. The external ones become increasingly important the higher you go in the organization. Mm -hmm. And this is something that women often aren't told. Mm -hmm. No, I think I think that's important. You know what I. I don't want to get too far off topic, but I've noticed, um, you know, at some job interviews as you move up in your career, the company actually wants to have an understanding of what your external network looks like. That's part of why they want to hire you is they want to bring that network in inside and into them. Um, and, and often I think we think of just our own skills in terms of what can we as one person do, but it really does matter about that network. Absolutely. For for several reasons, one might, might be that they want your network for business development. Mm-hmm. Another might be that they want your network for influencing the industry or connections into the industry. Mm-hmm. Another might be that they want your network for your ability to influence the business environment around the business. Mm-hmm that you're working it. So yes, I couldn't have said it better than you did. <laughs> <clears throat> well, it's it's a surprise and I think it becomes more and more relevant as you grow through your career, but often if you haven't been networking up until that point, you don't have the network built up to offer. 
Right. So it's a it's a very important point. Well, I mentioned to you before we got started that I first learned about you when a friend emailed me a link to your TED Talk, which was great. Um, the TED Talk is called The Career Advice You Probably Didn't Get. For anybody who hasn't seen it, I would definitely recommend checking it out. Um, Susan, I know you've had over 2 million views so far, which is incredibly exciting. Um so first of all, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Because <laughs> um, I'm such a big fan of TED Talks. I just, mm. it's so great. But in your talk, you actually discuss the missing 33% in advice given to women, which is such an interesting concept. Can you explain a little to our listeners about what that missing 33% is? Mm-hmm. So the understanding about the importance of the missing 33% came about because of my definition of leadership. So in 2000, Business Week had a cover story where the headline was, As Leaders, Women Rule. And the subheading was, New studies find that female managers outshine their male counterparts on almost every measure. Mm-hmm. So I looked at that headline uh, in, the, in the magazine shop, the newsstand, and, of course, laid my hands on the magazine. Uh, and my first reaction was, wow, this is awesome. You know, I've known for years that women make excellent managers and executives. It's so nice to see that the business press is talking about this. But then I said, well, if we're so good, why are there so few of us at the top? Mm-hmm. So I took all the studies in, that were mentioned in that article that I could lay my hands on. And, then, and we at Leading Women have been doing this now going forward since 2000. So every study that comes into the office, we do the same thing. We look at the competencies where women are rated by their bosses as outperforming men mm-hmm. or where men are rated by their bosses as outperforming women. And we slot them into the appropriate third of the leadership definition. Mm -hmm. So so when um, bosses rate women and men on things like resilience and um, optimism, uh, that would be personal greatness. When they rate them on empowering their teams, uh, strength of their networks, that would be engaging others. And then when they rate them on things like understands the big picture, is able to create a vision, is able to uh, make decisions based on the financial, the financials of the business. That would have to do with achieving and sustaining outcomes. Mm-hmm. And what we discovered um, surprised me a little bit that the bosses rate women and men as pretty equal in terms of using personal greatness, that third of the definition. They rate women as significantly outperforming men on the part of the definition that has to do with engaging the greatness in others, mm-hmm. both interpersonal and team skills. But they rate men as outperforming women on nearly all of the competencies we've ever come across that have to do with achieving and sustaining extraordinary outcomes, mm. which basically we summarize as business, strategic, and financial acumen. Mm-hmm. So there's this missing expectation that women are good at these things. That, in turn, colors the, the kinds of informal mentoring that women tend to get from men. Mm-hmm. And... We have since done a couple of other studies, which I could, I'll talk about. Um, I can talk about one of them later. But right now, most of the career advice that you would read in mm-hmm. existing books and articles that are directed toward women mm-hmm. don't mention the importance of business strategic and financial acumen at all. So we call this the missing 33% of the career success equation for women, not because women don't have or can't have business strategic and financial acumen, but it's wholly missing from the advice that we get and is missing from research tells us it's missing from what managers expect us to be good at. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important, and I think you're right. I actually see something 
similar in the digital marketing space, which, um, you know, kind of not to veer too far off track, but um, many digital marketers are doing things like Facebook and, um, you know, other random things that may not contribute to the company's bottom line. Um, I was a digital marketer in my previous career, and I focused on revenue generation, lead generation, sales. That was my specialty. And I found that companies, when I talk to them, they feel like, wow, you get what's important to us more than the other digital marketers that we talk to because the other folks don't focus on the financial impact of the business and they don't understand how the business works in the same way. And I, I know that's kind of a different comparison, but um, it's, it's really similar to me. It's exactly right on point, Angela. It's, I'm so glad you brought this up because so many women are managers in staff functions like marketing and human resources, mm-hmm. legal, um, even finance. And the ones that have a shot at getting ahead are the ones who are like you and are able to connect the work of that, that staff function to the overall metrics that Mm -hmm. matter to the business. I agree. I mean, the question you have to ask yourself is, why are we doing this? You know, I mean, at the end of the day, it's to drive revenue to the business. So how can we align our goals to that? Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, mm-hmm. I joke, this is slightly embarrassing, but I'll say it anyway. <laughs> One of my husbands used to say, <laughs> people who know what will always work for people who know why. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So knowing the why we're doing things, we call that pro- positional purpose, knowing your positional purpose, why your job exists in terms of contributing to uh, the key metrics of your business is crucial for leadership effectiveness and career advancement, and that's a piece of advice that women rarely hear. Well, you were, I, I don't know. How did you get this? Well, I think it came from a couple of things. Uh, first, I started my career in engineering, and so I had a very much of a math sort of foundation. Um, but I started my digital marketing career as an affiliate marketer, And that's essentially when you sell products for another company. I was selling shoes for Zappos.com. Oh. Right? (laughs) Which is such a great website. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) And at the time, it was a long time ago. um, It was like 2005. You, I would essentially take a 15% commission off of any sale that I could drive to them. And so every activity that I would focus on online would if I could not track it, if I could not show that it was going to put money in my bank account to pay my rent, I was not going to be focusing on it. And so I think that's probably for me like really where it kind of started. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, that opportunity to be close to sales mm-hmm. can help. Right. Yeah. I, so not so much because you had great mentors, but more because you had the the insight yourself based on the work that you were doing. Right. I mean, I was self-employed at that time. And I will say I also had a role as a director of digital strategy at a company here in Memphis called Service Master. And they own a number of home services companies, including Mary Maids. That was one of the brands that I worked on. And I had I worked on a team, and we were all peers. And our goals, um, each of us, our sole goal was to drive sales online. And so we'd sit down every month and compare. When I first started, Mary Maids was at the beginning of sort of their internet program. And by the time that I left, which was about four years later, I was generating over 60% of their U.S. sales online. Um, So that was another experience where, you know, the business really supported me in um, that goal. And it really reinforced that every single dollar needs to be used in a way that's effective and generates revenue. Right. That's so it's, great. So it's kind of a long answer. <laughs> yeah, no, that's um, wonderful. And, and I hope and think illustrative to people thinking, uh, listening to the podcast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so one thing that you mentioned um, earlier, 
you kind of alluded to is mentoring and how important mentoring is. I remember uh, some of the information that you shared that talked about the differences in mentoring with men versus women, the experience, and that really stuck out to me. Can you talk a little bit about what you found? Yeah, sure. So (laughs) throughout all my career, I had the good fortune to have mentors who made a difference in my career. And they helped me build confidence. They helped me identify my aptitudes. They connected me to courses I should take and books I should read and certifications I should look at. And they encouraged me to go after jobs that I never would have otherwise considered. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they gave me a little attitude adjustment. (laughs) So, Susan, really, you know, it's not personal, it's business, Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So I went along, and when mentoring became a very big thing in the 80s, uh, the consulting firm that, that I was part of helped launch a lot of mentoring programs, and we kind of launched them around that idea of mentoring. It's, we ca- I call it now supportive mentoring. Mm-hmm. But then in about 2004, I had the opportunity to hear a CEO talk about his career and the mentoring that he got um, early in his career. And it was so different from the mentoring that I had. Mm -hmm. I said, wow, there's this whole other kind of mentoring. What his experience, his experience was that he was mentored on the performance of the business. Mm -hmm. And he got that by attending board and executive team meetings and pre-briefing them with his CEO and debriefing them with his CEO. Mm -hmm. Because of those same experiences, he got mentoring on the image of leadership, how to conduct oneself in those venues, how to make a convincing business case, how to respectfully disagree, so the image of a leader. And he got very importantly, exposure to how decisions are made at higher levels. So he was an individual contributor, an accountant in the finance department at the time, but he was taking, taken under the wing of the CEO. Mm-hmm. So I said, holy cow, there's this whole other, much more strategic kind of mentoring. Mm-hmm. So when, when I started talking about these two different types of mentoring, I call them cake and pie. (laughs) (laughs) Because I love telling women, especially, you can have a piece of cake and a slice of pie. (laughs) Right. That's great. (laughs) Yeah. So cake mentoring is a mentoring like I got. So C for confidence, A for aptitudes and attitude adjustment, and sometimes just plain advice. K for connection to resources. And I know that's not how it's spelled, but Mm -hmm. uh, it made for a lovely uh, little... Um, abbreviation, and E for encouragement, so mm-hmm. cake mentoring. And what George, the, C- the CEO, got uh, was what I call pie mentoring, so performance of the bi- business, image of a leader, and exposure to decision-making mm-hmm. and decision-makers. Our research tells us that most women get and give cake mentoring. Mm-hmm. Um, most men receive pie mentoring, but they're unconscious of it. It happens just as a natural course of the conversations they have and the opportunities that are laid in front of them. Mm-hmm. So pie mentoring becomes something really important for women to be conscious of and to seek out. You don't have to wait for someone to tap you on the shoulder. You can actually, but very uh, systematically, ask uh, for someone to be your mentor and, and to focus on performance of the business, image of a leader, and exposure to decision-making. Right. I, I totally agree. And I, I feel like what you're saying is you're talking more about on the, the pie side, it's more about the value that you bring to the business. Exactly. On the cake side, it sounds like it's more about sort of making yourself a better person almost in a, in a certain regard. Um, yeah. And I think you have to really think about what is valued within the business. So that that makes sense. Um, you know, you mentioned that you don't need to wait for a mentor. Um, 
when someone is looking for a mentor, are there things that you suggest that they maybe keep in mind? Denise Morrison, who's the CEO of Campbell's, talks about how she has used mentoring throughout her career. And what she says is that in every job she held, she was looking ahead at the next possibility and weighing the skills, experiences, and knowledge that she had and that she needed. And then she would identify the gaps and look for mentors who could help fill those gaps. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very intelligent way to go about looking for a mentor. We, because so much of the advice around mentoring talks about these deep trusting relationships that you know go on and on and on for for years we tend to look for people who m- might have that supportive nurturing aspect to them and that can be very helpful and very important but it's not the end all and be all you might find that or or think that you, there's something about how you present yourself mm-hmm. that isn't quite right. And if that's the case, it's extremely valuable to get, to identify as a mentor someone who's very good at how she or he represents themselves, how he or she represents the business to the outside world, and ask them to mentor you on that very specific thing. I I know this might happen to you as well, where people ask you, will you be my mentor? Mm -hmm. That drives me absolutely crazy. (laughs) I don't know know why they're asking me. And it's so open-ended, I don't know what I'm getting into. But if someone says, Susan, you do a really good job at at speaking in front of groups or at making sense of the 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 of business fundamentals would you mentor me on that particular thing that becomes very doable yes yes i so, agree yeah. and i do get those kinds of questions <laughs> i bet you do <laughs> so so be strategic in identifying the gaps you want to work on and then find people, whether you like them or not, who are really good at those things. Right. We, we, had a, we did a, a program for a Fortune 20 company, and, and part of the program is to bring in a panel of executives. And one of the women executives said her father's advice to her was, find the person that no one likes and make them your best friend. Interesting. And I thought that was fascinating. Mm-hmm. Mm. Wow. Yeah. You know, my um, strategy has always been that one person is never, you know, people have different specialties that they're good at. You know, one person could be a great speaker. Another person may really understand financials. Um, But I've never thought of it as having one single mentor that's going to sort of be everything to me and that's going to teach me everything I need to know. Um, I think especially in the digital marketing space, there's no one person that has all the answers. So you may seek out one person to teach you about paid search. You may seek out another person to teach you about how to, you know, make podcasts. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And so I think you have to really, when you consider someone for a mentor, like you said, it's evaluate what is that thing that they really do better than everyone else? You know, are they just an amazing speaker? Are they great at figuring out how to push initiatives through the organization? I mean, what is it that that they know about that you want to know about? And trying to kind of go to them and be very specific. Like you said, it's it's very difficult when someone comes to you and kind of says, I just want your help in general with my career. (laughs) Right, right. Your message about the importance of having multiple mentors over mm-hmm. your career is extremely important, and thank you for making it. Mm-hmm. It's, it yeah. is really important. Can I say one other thing yeah, about of course. mentoring? So there's been quite a bit of talk lately about the importance of sponsors versus mentors. Yes. And uh, it, it rubs me a little bit the wrong way because when the original research was done on men's career success, 
the aspect of sponsorship was part of being mentored. Mm -hmm. And and when companies started to separate, uh, started to assign mentor-mentee or mentor-protege relationships, Mm -hmm. that sponsorship piece fell by the wayside. We, We have executives tell us, I will not spend social capital on someone I don't see as a partner in the business. Mm -hmm. So what I like to say about mentorship and and sponsorship is that pie mentoring specifically is a way to earn sponsorship, Mm -hmm. especially if you're working on the P in pie and the E. Um, understanding how decisions are made at higher levels, making better decisions, using your knowledge about the performance of the business, and and communicating that that's what you're doing. That helps you earn sponsorship. It helps you be seen as a partner in the business. <clears throat> right, I totally agree. I think it shows that you are aligned to the business's goals and, and that you're really on the same page. Well, a lot of what you talk about is, you know, getting women to the top, to the very top levels of leadership. And for women who are feeling frustrated, maybe they've made it to the middle, but they can't quite make it to the top. What advice do you have for them to kind of push through that? Whoa, I have a lot of advice. Okay. (laughs) Um, Well, in terms of seeking out resources, an executive coach like yourself who gets the missing 33%, who understands the importance of business strategic and financial acumen, as well as the interpersonal and team skills and your own personal um, strengths, attributes, and values. So someone who gets the complete leadership picture Mm -hmm. and can, can help you identify ways of presenting yourself as a leader, a complete leader, someone who is, as you just said, aligned with and supportive of the business. So finding an executive coach who can help with that. Ditto women or men mentors, but only if you're looking for pie mentoring. Mm -hmm. I think those are two of the best resources. Um, I was going to say something else about that. Oh, learning how to speak the language, we call it the language of power. So Mm -hmm. learning how to talk about your accomplishments, not in terms of the activities that you did, but the outcomes that you achieved. So a little bit earlier in our Mm -hmm. call, you said you generated over 60% of all the sales. There are very few women who present themselves on resumes, in conversation, or on LinkedIn with the metrics behind their contributions. Mm -hmm. So that's another piece of advice. If you're frustrated, learn how to talk, speak the language of business and to lead with it, especially when you're talking up the organization. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. If you have it, if you don't understand finances and the story they tell, uh, strategy, how and why it's set, uh, the overall uh, importance of key business metrics and how they are, the the levers that that drive them, then, you know, find coaches, find mentors, read books, take classes, because all of that will help you be a better uh, contributor to the business. And while it's never too early to do that in your career, you can start that as an individual contributor. It can become too late. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You may have such a strong reputation that doesn't include being a a partner in the business that if you stay at your company, you won't be able to progress. Mm -hmm. I I do sometimes suggest that uh, people look at switching to another company that might be more open to them or you know, may have a a slightly different culture as well. And it actually makes me think of one last question I'd love to um, get your thoughts on. I know for me, one of the issues that I struggled with um, working in corporate was there were often these very sort of informal networking things going on where um, people would go together to play golf or to play poker. And, um, you know, I was 
probably a little naive, and I, I started taking golf lessons thinking that was the key to getting invited to golf, <laughs> was to learn to play golf, and it actually did not help. Um, so uh, because often the groups that would go were men, and they would just probably not even think to invite me despite that I had learned to play golf. So for women that are kind of finding themselves on the outside in, in that sort of a way, do you have any advice for how to handle it? Yes. Uh, I have two pieces of advice. The first one is to do a strategic analysis of the most important people to have in your network internally and externally. And again, this is something that women often aren't told to do. And, And what makes that analysis strategic is thinking both in terms of the value creation stream that you're part of and in terms of where you want to go in the organization. Mm -hmm. So once you've done that and figured out who really do I need to have good relationships with to contribute to the business in the the position that I hold and to create opportunities for the future, then the second piece of advice is if you're left out of informal networking situations, create your own. Mm. So invite them, you know, invite one or two of them at a time to lunch or coffee. Uh, if they're women, <laughs> invite them to a to a spa day. You know? mm-hmm. um, so whether they're inside or outside the organization, you can create the, your own informal networking opportunities with with people who are important. Well, that's excellent advice. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners today? I feel like we've covered quite a bit. We have. I would like to talk about, I I was so impressed and delighted that you you threw in the point that you generated over 60% of (laughs) sales because it's so illustrative of a skill that women need to develop. So Mm -hmm. not only in terms of speaking the language of power, so leading with that when you're communicating up, But also, it's very useful, we get a bum rap for not Mm self-promoting. And most of us are uncomfortable when the self-promotion is about how great we are. But we are paid to move the business forward, Mm -hmm. which makes it always graceful and authentic when we talk, as you did, about the contribution to the key metrics that we're advancing. Mm -hmm. So... So with that in mind, it becomes a little easier to think about self-promotion because we aren't really promoting ourselves. We're promoting the impact that we and our teams are having on the business, and that, in fact, is what we're paid to do. Right. It's about results. And I think the issue often, I think, is growing up, we're told, you know, not to brag and you know, to kind of blend in with everyone else. At least that's, I think, the message I received. And um, I I think you kind of have to break away from that and you have to put it aside and and realize that this is not about bragging. This is about showing your value. Exactly. And it's about showing your value in the context of the business. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Well, Susan, thank you so much. If anybody is interested to reach out to you, you know, where would you suggest that they go first? The best place to go would be our website, which is leadingwomen, all one word, dot biz. B is in boy. <laughs> B is <as> in bread. <laughs> I, Z is in zebra. So leadingwomen, dot biz. There's, a, there's a, a range of resources there, including our blog. And, um, of course, we're on Twitter at, at Leading Women, and you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Oh, that's great. And also, as I mentioned earlier, you do also have a TED Talk, The Career Advice You Probably Didn't Get, and I, I definitely encourage everyone to check it out. Susan, thank you so much for joining me. This has been great. It has been delightful, Angela. Thank you for being such a great role model Aww. in your career and for the very important work you do with your clients and uh, 
putting important messaging out through your podcast. It's been a delight to get to know you. Well, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for listening. Tune in next week for another edition of the Copeland Coaching Podcast. And if you haven't already, please be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher to make sure that you never miss an episode. Thank you for listening to the Copeland Coaching Podcast today with your host, Angela Copeland. Tune in next time to get more great tips on turning your job search into a slam dunk.